Good morning. Welcome to our worship service here at Ridgecrest United Methodist Church in the high desert of California. I'm glad that you have joined us this day. We have our music team of Patrick Rent on piano, David Hodgson as our lead singer and soloist, Ted Fisk on guitar, and Elliot Keeter on the clarinet. If you are following along live, I invite you to send in any prayer requests or comments you have on our Facebook feed, and we will try to get to those later in our time during our, our prayer time in the service. So today begins a three-week sermon series called Three Simple Rules, and Part of this is based on this book that was written by Bishop Reuben Job several years ago, A Wesleyan Way of Living. And I'd like to begin with the opening prayer that comes from this book. Let us pray. Loving God, our teacher, come and make your home in our hearts this day. Dwell within us all day long and save us from error or foolish ways. Teach us today to do no harm, to do good, and assist us so that we may stay in loving relationship with you and our neighbor. Help us today to be an answer to one another's prayer so that we may be one of your signs of hope in the world you love. Amen. Our scripture, readers for this, scripture readings for this morning comes from the first letter to the Corinthians, verse 8 and 9. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. And from Galatians 5, 13 to 15. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love, become slaves to one another. For the whole law was summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, 
Take care that you are not consumed by one another. And then from the Gospel of Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 6 and 7. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, these three simple rules, as I referred to earlier, a book written by Bishop Reuben Job, but really where Bishop Job draw these from is, is from my good man, John Wesley, my namesake, by the way. And uh, this is John, and like all good Methodist preachers, we have John Wesley watching over us. So I'm going to put him back here on the altar. So he can keep an eye on all of us. John Wesley, he was the founder of the, the Methodist movement in England in the 18th century. Preached and taught in his genius was organizing small groups, society, cells, bands, cell and class meetings in which he took people, people, many of them who were part of what is known as the Church of England, the Anglican Church, but also people who are the, the dissenters, who are not part of that group, and even people who had a very loose affiliation with any organized religion, but were drawn in by the evangelistic call and the outreach of John Wesley and the other Methodist leaders in that time. As he formed those groups and met with them, John Wesley articulated a set of general rules highlighted by three main or general rules. And Bishop Job, who wrote the book, Three Simple Rules, expounds on this by saying, these rules have the power to change the world. While they are ancient, they have seldom been fully put to the test, but when and where they are practiced, the world of things as they are are shaken, a new formation. This way of living was given to John Wesley in a time much like our own, a time in which there was unrest in society, a time in which people were struggling and feeling oppressed, a time in which there were hardworking people who worked hard but didn't seem to advance any in their economic standing. So John Wesley took a blueprint of the rules and he fleshed it out and he taught it and he practiced it and he handed it down to all of us in the Methodist tradition, a way of life for us to live. Wesley believed that everyone needs help in living a holy and good life. And one of his concerns, and it was a concern that was born out of his own experience and observation as he traveled around England was that new converts to the faith would backslide or slip away and they needed some help, they needed some discipline. And hence, the small groups, and hence, these rules which were intended to give a framework for them. He believed that discipline practices would help one lead in faithfulness following the way of Jesus. And so we can find some of these rules and background in our United Methodist Book of Discipline, which is both our rule book, but it's also our book that gives our articles of faith, our doctrinal heritage, our theological task, our history. It, it tells us who we are as Methodist in our heritage and who we are currently as a United Methodist denomination. John Wesley said this, he says, if you are interested in being 
part of one of these small groups, if you are interested in being part of these societies, then there is only one condition, a desire to flee from the wrath to come and to be saved from your sins. And so the door is open, my friends. That condition really has not changed for all who seek God to flee from the wrath to come. And what is that wrath? Is it what is going on in some ways in our society in present days? Is it the wrath that is to be the judgment of God at the end of the age? Is it the salvation that we want in our own lives? A salvation that does not have to wait till the end of the age or even the end of our life. That's a salvation that we can have right here and now. But we work out our salvation with faith, with trembling, with struggle, with love, and with care. And so the first rule that John Wesley articulated was this. Doing, by doing no harm, by avoiding evil of every kind, especially that which is most generally practiced, such as, and then he enumerates a list. Now, reading this list, you can nod your head in affirmation that maybe some things haven't changed, in other ways, maybe they are dated in some way. But here are some of those things, and I'm not going to read all of the list. It's a long list, actually. The taking of the name of the God in vain. The profaning the day of the Lord, either by doing ordinary work therein, therein or by buying or selling. Drunkenness, buying or selling spirituous liquors or drinking them, unless in a cases of extreme necessity. Slaveholding buying or selling slaves, fighting, quarreling, brawling, brother going to law with brother, returning evil for evil or railing for railing, the using of many words in buying or selling. The intent by Wesley was to give some type of guide in some specific instances in which people who were meeting in these small groups could read or hear from their class leader an understanding and think back in their own life for that past week. What did I do? How did I live my life? Were there any things in this way that fit this list and category that John Wesley enumerated and described? In essence, this first step, doing no harm, is avoidance which isn't misguided as far as guidance goes. I mean, we pray the Lord's Prayer, lead me not in temptation. But avoidance means learning what to avoid. And I suppose you could take John Wesley's list, or you could find another religious leader in another faith tradition, or you could just take the words of the Bible themselves in different places and construct your list of avoidance, things to do that would do no harm. But as well and good as that is, we as people still struggle because we end up still doing harm. So what if we took the next step? What if we thought, instead of not just doing no harm, but what if we stopped and assessed not only our actions, but our words, but also our thoughts, to include it to the point of engaging others in this. And in some ways, this was the genius of the small class meetings and the cell groups, the sense of accountability in which person to person asking questions of each other, holding each other accountable. What if one of the ways that we could hold ourselves accountable is, is if we let someone else know, someone preferably trusted, but maybe if we're willing to open up to anyone and say, would you let me know if there are things that I say 
if there are things that I say in the way that I say them, or if there are things that I do that causes harm to you, or causes harm to another person that you know, or perhaps to a class of people, a category of people. And would you let me know when I speak those words or do those things, and would you explain to me how that is harmful? And then we submit ourselves in a step of listening, listening to be honest and open so that we're not being defensive, and we're not being judgmental, but we're really seeking to learn, which is the essence of a great theological position which says faith seeking understanding. And then what if I took the next step beyond my own individual actions, beyond letting others communicate to me where I have caused harm, that we might bring that to our larger society, to any groups that we're part of, our groups at work, our schools, our church, organizations and clubs that we're part of, maybe the political parties we're part of, maybe our communities in which we live in, and we say, what is it that is systemic, that is built in to the way we act and behave, built into perhaps cultural misappropriations built into laws and we work to then go what is causing harm in this way how can I speak up how can I take a step and a stand now folks brothers and sisters in America this isn't uncommon I mean this is in a way what democracy is about and we have seen it in our country in the following ways. The Emancipation Proclamation by President Lincoln, ending slavery. Later on, the 15th Amendment, which was an amendment that ended up allowing blacks, including those recently freed slaves, to vote. And yet it obviously didn't go far enough because women still couldn't vote. So a few decades later, we had to have the 19th Amendment. Later on in our court system, Brown versus the Board of Education, one of those court cases that helped end, end segregated schools and work toward ending segregation in this country. And yet, if there's anything that the past few weeks have told us, that the issue of civil rights and the issue of relationship with blacks and whites and persons of color is still not completely resolved. Bishop Job, in his book, Three Simple Rules, writes, I have found that this first step, the doing no harm, when practice can end up providing a safe place to stand while the hard and faithful work of discernment is done. When we agree that we will not harm those with whom we disagree, then we can have conversation and dialogue and there can be discovery of new insight that is possible. And if all who are involved can agree to do no harm, the climate in which the conflict is going on can immediately be changed. Well, how does it get changed? If I am not doing any harm, then I am no longer gossiping about that conflict. I am no longer using social media to pass on inflammatory or untruthful things. I am no longer speaking disparagingly about people involved. I am no longer manipulating the facts of the conflict. I am no longer diminishing those who disagree with me, and instead I seek to honor them as a child of God. When I am determined to do no harm, I am able to see and uh, hear the other person more clearly. Do no harm. If you are a police officer, what does that mean? Police officers may have to use force. That's the nature of the business. That's, that's the nature of what 
they are constituted for at times. But is it force that is not a necessary force? Is there a limit to that? Do no harm. If you are a Boy Scout leader, what does that mean? It means keeping your appropriate distance when teaching or counseling. No sharing a tent with a minor. No time alone with a scout. Do no harm. If you are an electric company, what does that mean? Maybe that means you inspect your power and transmission lines for safety features. Maybe that means you shut them down in high winds and super dry conditions so that there won't be any fire sparked by that. Do no harm. Maybe that means if you are going to protest and advocate a position, you do so without destroying property. Do no harm. Maybe that means if you're going to protest and advocate a position, you can go do that peacefully without having water cannons fired at you and police dogs set upon you, biting you and tearing your flesh apart. Maybe that means you can go sit peacefully near a church without having police come and interrupt your peaceful protest by firing tear gas and rubber bullets fired upon you. Do no harm. Maybe if you are in law enforcement or the legal field, as an attorney, as a prosecutor, you make arrest and you prosecute with the right evidence to protect the innocent. Do no harm. In our United Methodist Baptismal Covenant, which is found in our United Methodist Hymnal, you can find this specific part on page 34 in the United Methodist Hymnal, it includes questions in the baptismal covenant for both baptism and church membership. And there's one question that says, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? So if you have been baptized or joined the United Methodist Church within the last 30 years, you should have professed these words. What is going on in our world today, I think it calls to all of us to take the freedom to resist evil and fight injustice and work on the side of the oppressed. The first step may be ceasing your words. The first step may mean not speaking out when we weigh it against doing no harm. In our gospel words that Jesus speaks about how we have relations with our brothers and sisters tells us that the consequences of doing harm are severe. What if we judged our actions by, is this putting a stumbling block into someone else? Later, as the early church was growing and they struggled with, with incorporating those Jewish people of faith who decided that yes, Jesus was the Messiah, and they moved in their Jewish faith into accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And the Gentile, non-Jewish people, who came from a different background, and they were all incorporated in together. And how did that mean in their, their daily practices? How they ate food, how they worshipped together, how they celebrated Holy Communion together? Advocating a belief, Paul does, that you have been given freedom. Freedom in Christ. And one of those choices in freedom is perhaps making a decision that while what you are doing may be okay, maybe the better choice is to do no harm to someone else by giving them their own freedom to see that there is a better way with Christ. I know some of you who are part of our church and probably watching are part of the Rotary Club. I like how the Rotary Club's statements, their rules fit into this do no harm. They ask four questions. Is it truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Wesley's general rules are do no harm, do good, stay in love of God. And all of, them have root, all of them have specific examples, but 
the rooting of that, of course, is in Christ. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. But it sets up principles for us to follow. As we have been set free, free in the salvation, not just for ourselves, but free in salvation so that we actually consider one another. Or to put it in the words that are consistent with John Wesley that Bishop Job writes about in his book, if what you are doing is harming someone else and it is within the power of you to stop or change, then stop. It doesn't matter if it's legally permissible under the laws of the government. It doesn't matter if it's culturally acceptable to the majority of your society. It doesn't matter if it doesn't harm you. There is a larger moral or ethical or spiritual context. Do not be harmful unnecessarily to your neighbor, your friend, or your co-worker. Bishop Job goes on to say, why don't we take this first step to do no harm? And often it's because it demands too much in the way of self-discipline. It actually pushes us to have a deep faith with God and to trust that God will empower and lead us. And that can be scary. Sometimes it's much easier to hold on to what we know rather than to step out into something that is threatening. A second reason may be that we have bound ourselves to a certain ideology whether it's a political ideology, a cultural ideology, a societal ideology, or a theology, rather than binding ourselves to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we may end up, and I have been guilty of this in my own life, following a loyalty to a theological position, which I will use over following a loyalty to Jesus Christ. And finally, we may be afraid of the consequences of following this rule. We may realize that to follow it may set us on a path that we really do not want to go. And yet, the good news is, is that we do not make our attempt to live out this rule and the other rules that will be spoken about in the coming weeks alone. Not only is the benefit of these rules as Wesley articulated them to be lived out within a group, a small group. We can do the same in our church, within our families, within other groups that we are part of, that we meet with to study the Bible with or pray with. That can become our group that walks with us so we're not alone but also the promise of Jesus, of course, that he gives his apostles at the end of Matthew. Lo, I am with you always until the end of the age. And the promise that he tells them in the end of Luke, in the beginning of Acts, the Holy Spirit will come and that Holy Spirit will lift you and empower you and guide you. To do no harm involves a transformation that we can actually live out the moments of our lives as Jesus did and calls us to. I would hope that you and whoever is your group, whoever is your kin, whoever is your tribe, can take the do no harm. And maybe you want to follow up with that and, and just discuss with others, you know, what are the ways that there is harm being done by me? And use that as a way to grow and stretch yourself and to stretch your faith. A year ago in May, I was privileged to go to the local uh, community town mayor's prayer breakfast. And at that breakfast, there was a handout with a little uh, slip of paper. And, and the speaker talked about this, the prayer of Jabez, which is found in First Chronicles 410. Now, there was a book written about this a few years ago, and, and I know about this prayer. And, but what was interesting at the prayer breakfast last year was the translation that was used was a little bit different than some of the others. And what caught my eye was the wording 
in the last phrase of this prayer. And I want to use this prayer to close this day. This is the way it ends. Oh God, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. That I may not Calls pain, that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. May it ever be so. Amen. Send us love, send us power, 
send us grace. I invite you, wherever you are, to take a moment and pause and settle your hearts and your minds and enter into this time of prayer. And then following the pastoral prayer, if you would join me in the Lord's Prayer, knowing that we are united across the marbles of technology and the Internet in this way. If you would keep in prayer Julie Gervais, who had uh, cancer surgery this past week for uh, the lymph nodes in uh, her throat, her neck area, and her tongue area. Um, she will also be going for further consult to consider continued options uh, for that. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prayers also for Jenny Frizz, who uh, went into the hospital and is in the T crew unit for um, some care in these days. And so, Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. I invite you to be in prayer for our United Methodist denomination, specifically the California Pacific Annual Conference, of which we are a part of. Normally, at this time of year, our annual conference meets in its annual session at the University of Redlands for a few days. We're meeting, but not in person at Redlands. It'll be all virtual as a Zoom webinar. Um, myself, Michelle Kilikakis, and Laura Lee Miller are our representatives, and we will be participating, including voting on any legislation. You can go to our CalPAC website, and you can find out uh, information on the conference and how you can watch and follow along um, on the different business of that. So I know that other annual conferences across the U.S. are doing similar things or postponing until later in the summer and actually having in-person meetings, um, but be in prayer for us of that as well. Be in prayer for our, our governmental leaders as they continue to lead us in this time of the coronavirus pandemic and as our health officials give guidance and also as we as a society become more present publicly that we might find ways to do no harm to care for those so they do not get sick as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bow with me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you are a forgiving God. We thank you that you look at our actions, our deeds, our sayings, our words, our thoughts, the innermost being of our hearts. And when any of those fall in the category of being callous, insensitive, cruel, hateful, harmful, sinful, wrong. You take us back and you forgive us. We know that there's a lesson there, O oh God, that, that your example of forgiveness might set us up to forgive the same way with others. Oh God, if there's one thing that we, unfortunately, as your human creation, creatures and creations are often good at, it is causing harm. And so we confess that before you this morning. And we know that if we pause and stop and reflect that 
really, we must confess that. We must ask in repentance for forgiveness. Not only of you, but of others, the people that we engage with. So lead us in this way, O oh God. Lead us and hear us. Be patient with us. Bestow your loving kindness upon us so that we can bestow that same loving kindness on others. In the prayer that we pray united together, has something to say about this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Time for offering and announcements. I thank you for your continued support of this particular church in your financial contributions. And I thank you for your financial contributions that go to support those organizations that are doing good in the world. And I know that many of you support those groups, either locally within our town or within our state in the nation and around the world. And so that is needed more than ever. Thank you for that. Some announcements are Pentecost Prayer Walking Path, the stations that have been on our church grounds for the past few weeks. That ends today. So um, it's a lovely day here in the high desert. Temperatures are great. And so come out and, and enjoy that if you are locally here. Our midweek kids programs continues every Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 12 noon. Drive through uh, in the south parking lot by our social hall. And this week's free handout for kids is a free craft project for every kid that is in a vehicle. As mentioned earlier, the, the rest of the Sundays in June will follow the Three Simple Rules book of the sermon series and then our upper room suppers meals continue still as takeout only. Um, and we continue to see high numbers of people come. And thank you for those that support that ministry and your gifts as well. Let us close our service in this time. Bye.
Receive the benediction with believing hearts. God our Father says, You are always welcome. Jesus the Son says, I will always walk with you. God the Holy Spirit says, I will always strengthen and empower you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen.